Welcome back to the Shifting Schools podcast. I'm here with Dr. Charles Barrett today, uh, the author of the book, Social Justice in Schools, A Framework for Equity in Education. Uh, Charles, welcome to the Shifting Schools podcast. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Yeah, and we're really excited to have you here, you know, at the beginning of a school year, uh, talking about this idea of social justice, the idea of equity. And I wanted to get started with just thinking about your book. Uh, why, why write it? Uh, what was kind of the, the, uh, the premise for writing it? We've talked about in the intro that you are a school psychologist. Uh, and, and who do you think here at the beginning of the school year, really, you know, this book do you think would be best suited for? Sure. So I'll say, I'll take the second part first. All right. This book is broad enough for any school-based educator, even not school-based. If you're a central office, if you're a superintendent, you're a director, but I wrote this for anyone who serves children or has a hand mm -hmm. in providing um, services or supports to to young people. So it's teachers, it's principals, it's school psychologists, of course, other mental health providers in schools. And it really gives um, kind of a nice framework to how do we promote more equitable outcomes for all young people. I was writing and um, speaking on these topics for the last couple of years. So it was a great opportunity through Guilford Press to kind of consolidate or um, what's the word, kind of um, connect all these ideas into one resource that, again, anyone who works in schools, for schools, could use um, in their practice. So again, mental health providers, instructors, um, administrators, really great framework to get the year started as you work with your school-based teams, you work with your departments. It really just informs our thinking about young people and what's good for them. I love that. And uh, as a consultant myself, I know you get to that point where all of a sudden you're like, I've got enough ideas here. I probably really should just sit down and put these all in a book. Correct. Correct. <laughs> uh, I love that. Um, let's talk a little bit about just this idea, you know, around increasing access opportunity and equitable outcomes for students. You know, that is something we're really focused in on right now. Uh, we have a lot of districts across the nation and across the world that are really focused on this idea of SEL. As we start the as we start the year, what are some of the maybe quick hits uh, that we can kind of think about uh, as a teacher in the classroom or as a school leader that you think would be really good to kind of be thinking about uh, to get the school year started? So I would say um, at the heart of what we do as educators is relationship. Mm -hmm. So I would think about. Um, that's with students, that's with families, that's, you know, between your staff. So as you develop relationship with people, um, think about who those individuals are and what they need to have adequate access or opportunity to be successful. And that could be different for um, students versus staff, but for folks on kids, that could be different based on who your students are. So my background is that I served um, primarily Spanish-speaking students from Central America for 13 mm. years as a school psychologist. So when I think about access and opportunity, I think about when we have parent meetings, for example, or any any meeting, are there interpreters present to mm make information accessible to the family. I think about when do we have our meetings and our families available to participate in a meaningful way. Even at the meeting, I think about who speaks first and mm. what tone does that send for how much we value the family's input or perspective on their child. So those are just some quick ideas about who are you serving and what can you do to facilitate meaningful engagement um, you know, for them. At the heart of social justice, I believe, are those two terms, access and opportunity. Who has it 
and who does not. And when we promote meaningful ac access and opportunity, then we will promote more equitable outcomes for our students. So when we see these uneven outcomes or disparate outcomes or disproportionality, I do believe at the heart of that, it's in some way unequal access and opportunity to information. There's a point I make in the book that knowledge is power, mm. but, in, but access to information is key. Schools have a lot of knowledge, a lot of power. So even how do you pr uh, promote providing families with information so they can be their child's most informed and effective advocate? So it's bringing them in, you know, early in the school year for this informational session about here's how you access free reduced lunch. Here's how you access, you know, support for your child after school. Or here's how you access um, supports through an IEP explain things to people in ways that are beneficial or meaningful. And then I do believe that that's how we increase engagement and then ultimately more equitable outcomes for young people. I love that. And I think it's also, I think you make a really good point of understanding your specific community mm -hmm. and knowing when might be the right time to have that parent night or that information session, Correct. you know, uh, whether it's early in the morning before mm -hmm. people go to work or it's at, you know, late in the afternoon. But I think understanding that in a lot of our communities, especially nowadays, not everybody works the traditional nine to five job Sure. and, you know, and thinking about, okay, well, if I'm, you know, if, if I know that I'm trying to reach a specific parent group. Mm -hmm. I need to understand when those parents might be working, what shifts those parents might be picking up. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking as I'm recording this, I'm in Spokane and they are building, they've already got two big Amazon facility centers here and they're building a third one. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking that there are six different shifts that they run at Amazon. Your parents aren't probably running, you know, a ch chances are that they're not just working the nine to five shift. And so right, you might right. say that you're doing things equitable by having a parent night at 6 p.m., but what parents are being left out because that's their shift. Exactly right. right. So exactly. do you think about, are there other ways, you know, we talk about informing parents uh, in ways of doing these, these parent, these, you know, parent uh, information nights or, or parents, are there other ways that you see that we should as schools and school leaders be thinking about how do we reach out to some of these communities that, that might be uh, in our schools? Sure. So I think that one of the lessons or benefits even of the pandemic was that we did shift a lot of our practice to virtual or remote mm -hmm. um, kind of practices. And that did in many ways increase family engagement for meetings. So if the family now can stay at work or stay at home and join virtually for an IEP meeting or virtually for parent-teacher conference, that does increase a lot of their engagement and opportunity to really uh, participate in their child's education. So I think about the flexibility that we need mm -hmm. to have in schools. Um, this idea of giving everyone the same is often unjust mm -hmm. because people are not the same. So mm -hmm. how, how can we first, again, know who we're serving, who are we um, you know, trying to reach, and then be flexible in our approach to provide opportunities that meet the needs of various uh, parent groups, family groups, even student groups. But information for me has been kind of a central thing. I've seen in my work that the family oftentimes comes in with a disadvantage of not knowing who to call or how to mm. navigate this complex world of, of public education. So providing them access to those resources, but we're just telling them, you know, families right. call me, I give you the answer. I'm, I'll, I'll give you the cheat codes, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you use them to really advocate for your child in the best way that you know how, but, mm. but that's a big one. Uh, again, even, the dynamic in the meeting, many times we talk for the first 35 minutes at school base and and then say, you know, mom, dad, any questions or any, any input? And even that centers the school voice over mm -hmm. the parent voice. Uh, but those are just some ideas that have been meaningful to me that I unpack further, you know, in the book, uh, you know, as you read it. And I, I love that idea of <laughs> the the complexity of public education. Mm -hmm. And I think when we're in public education, 
we don't always think of it as being complex because we live it like we're in it every day. Mm -hmm. But for, for parents who don't live and breathe it like we do as educators, it is a very complex system. I know 504s and IEPs and, you know, we all we, we love our acronyms in education. Okay. Yeah. And they all just roll off of our tongue. But for, for a parent trying to navigate the complexity of, of a school in a district, I think, is really where having advocates as school psychologists, as school right. counselors that are really looking at this through an equitable lens, mm -hmm. I think is, is critical for schools to be to be thinking about. Absolutely. If we kind of, you know, zoom back a bit uh, in your book, you discuss specific actions that schools or even entire districts can kind of take can uh, can take to kind of improve equitable outcomes for for students. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe touch on what are some of the the things that that schools or school districts can do to just help with equitable outcomes for for kids? Sure, but first I want to just unpack that 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 mm -hmm. term equitable outcomes because I think okay. that the book's title has both social justice and equity. And I think oftentimes in education, we see those terms as synonymous. And I mm -hmm. don't think they're synonymous. And what I talk about in the book is really um, equity being an outcome or a result and social justice being the path to how we get there. Mm -hmm. So I would say that socially just practices lead to equitable outcomes. So like if that. we have inequities in our outcomes and our results and our data, there's oftentimes a socially unjust practice that led to that. Now, it's not always intentional. It could be unintentional that, you know, um, there are policies and practices that are not good for all kids. I do sure. believe that most people who work in schools really like children and really are doing the best they can. But when we know better, we do better. So. Mm. My focus is kind of thinking about how do we do things? What are we doing intentionally that leads to these more positive or equitable, out equitable outcomes? One um, example that I can unpack a little bit is around this issue of discipline mm. that we have across the country and the disparate outcomes that we have across various student groups. That could be minoritized students, that could be students with disabilities in, in, in different categories. But I think about how do we reframe discipline in general by mm. taking first a more positive approach. So I'm thinking about our tier one, what does everybody get? So it could be through PBIS or positive behavior um, interventions and, and supports. And then looking at um, how do those tier one practices um, lead to different outcomes for your various student groups. And then you might have to do some more specialized things for certain students at tier two than at tier three. But I think it does start with a more positive framing of how do we teach expectations rather than punish students for not meeting what we might not have taught them um, intentionally or explicitly. The second mm -hmm. thing I think about is moving away from this punitive approach. You know, I I talk about zero tolerance, which hopefully is gone from most public schools, but it is out there sometimes um, and it's not effective. Zero tolerance, meaning the idea that even minor behavioral infractions like being late to class or not having materials or minor, you know, um, defiance, disrespect, things like that, that should not lead to suspensions are happening mm. still. So again, how do we um, reframe punishment as really teaching students what's appropriate for school versus not appropriate um, for school. I also talk about how do we empower teachers to respond more effect effectively to behavior rather than always referring students to the office where they mm. miss instructional time and then the chances of being excluded through suspension or expulsion increase exponentially. So I think it's, again, the book gives a framework without being overly prescriptive. Because I do believe it starts with how do we think differently about the work we're doing as teachers, as counselors, psychologists, social workers, principals, mm. um, and really embedding that framework into reteaching expectations rather than punishing students for what they might not be doing in school. Mm, I love that. Again, the name of that book is Social Justice in Schools, a Framework for Equity in Education. 
course, you can get that everywhere. Uh, you can find books and we'll make sure there's a link in the show notes as well. As we get ready to start another school year here, um, uh, you also consult with schools uh, and, and support schools. What does that look like? If there's a school that is listening to this podcast and they're saying, oh my gosh, Dr. Barrett's the guy. We, we need to bring him in. We've got some work to do in our district. Sure. What does that look like? What does that look like when, when a school district reaches out to you and, and maybe wants to, to bring you on as a partner in learning? So I, I fundamentally am a psychologist, but beyond that, I really am an educator. So I mm. enjoy the teaching process. I enjoy engaging you know, with people um, through my background in school psychology. So it's, it's easy. I'm a pretty easygoing, down-to-earth guy. You go to my website, charlesbarrett.org, or you email me at charles at charlesbarrett.org, and we, we make it happen. It's, it's really very, very simple. I love to do it. I speak to graduate students all the time in different fields, schools and school districts, but really love to engage with people and, and help them along in their process, meeting them where they are and giving you some concrete um, strategies and principles that can really be implemented to promote more positive and effective outcomes for your students. I love that. I love that. Again, uh, it's uh, Dr. Charles Barrett. Uh, this book is Social Justice in Schools, a Framework for Equity in Education. And again, you can reach out to him at his website. We'll have all of that and more down in the show notes. Charles, thank you so much for spending some time with us today talking about your book. Um, anything else on the horizon for you? Or are you are you just uh, are you just doing the consultancy thing now? Presenting around with this book? You working on another book? Or uh, and what's, um, maybe what's the feedback been? Have you gotten some great stories of people just saying thank you? I mean, to me as an author, that was always the best when somebody reaches out and is like, "Oh my gosh, nothing this like is exactly it. what I needed in the moment I needed it." You know, nothing like it. So yes, yeah. I've heard from faculty and school site programs. I've heard great. from teachers and counselors who are using it in in different ways. Some are reading uh, or last summer, but um, it's it's been great so far. It's still early in the process. Sure. Um, I still work full-time for a school district, which I love. Um, one of my other projects is I, I do a, every summer a Today in School Psychology book. This is why a day without direct contact with students is wasted. Um, uh -huh. So I, I, I kind of compile short stories and interactions with kids because that really fuels my work. All that I write, all that I teach is based on real practice in schools. Um, so still kind of being con con connected to a school system, school district, you know, school building, still testing kids and meeting with families gives me such on the ground, meaningful perspective. That I never want to lose that. So still writing, still practicing full time. Awesome. Um, still supporting psychologists as an administrator. Um, books on the horizon for sure with Guilford and some of my own projects. So take a look at that. The website will certainly keep you updated, charlesbarrett.org. But uh, yes, social media, you can follow me. I'll share the handles and you can have that as yeah. well in the show notes. But just good work for kids. And that, that really drives me. And that's why I'm here. I love that. That's what we're all about. Doing the best we can with the kids and, and to continue to grow. You sure. Know? And I think sure. that's that's this, you know, a big part of your message is, you know, you know, how do we just continue to grow and do what we want and what we know is best for kids. Correct. Uh, and that's the constant strive of public education, you know, just every day get a little bit better on behalf of the, of, of our students. So. Correct. Correct. Charles, thank you so much for spending some time being here today. Really appreciate you having you on the podcast and part of our mini series around uh, SEL in schools. Thank Wonderful. you. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this conversation and we'd like to invite you to make a contribution to our podcast communities conversation about it when you head over to camp.shiftingschools.com again that link is over there in the show notes you can join a community of listeners where we are inviting you to deliver your feedback for you to really respond to some of the key questions here and one of those questions that we are thinking about after this conversation is as we hope to deliver and cultivate SEL for our young learners, there are some skills that we as school leaders, as educators need to be working on for ourselves. What do you think is one of the most important ones that we need to work on in order to lead for SEL? 
If you've got thoughts about that question or anything to do with this week's episode, please head over to camp.shiftingschools.com and weigh in. See you again next week.